chapter 11. With his two pieces of silver, Wang Lung paid for a hundred miles of road. And the officer who took his silver from him gave him back a handful of copper pence. And with a few of these, Wang Lung bought from a vendor who thrust his tray of wares in at a hole in the wagon as soon as it stopped, four small loaves of bread and a bowl of soft rice for the girl. It was more than they had to eat at one time for many days. And although they were starved for food, when it was in their mouths, desire left them. And it was only by coaxing that the boys could be made to swallow. But the old man sucked perseveringly at the bread between his toothless gums. One must eat, he cackled forth, very friendly to all who pressed about him as the fire wagon rolled and rocked on its way. I do not care that my foolish belly is growing lazy after all these days of little to do. It must be fed. I will not die because it does not wish to work. And then laughed suddenly at the smiling, wizened little old man, whose sparse white beard was scattered all over his chin. But not all the copper pence did Wang Long spend on food. He kept back all he was able to buy mats to build a shed for them when they reached the south. There were men and women in the fire wagon who had been south in other years, some who went each year to the rich cities of the south to work and to beg and thus save the price of food. And Wang Lung, when he had grown used to the wonder of where he was and to the astonishment of seeing the land whirl by the holes in the wagon, listened to what these men said. They spoke with the loudness of wisdom where others were ignorant. First you must buy six mats said one, a man with coarse hanging lips like a camel's mouth. These are two pence for one mat, if you are wise and do not act like a country bumpkin, in which case you will be charged three pence, which is more than is necessary, as I very well know. I cannot be fooled by the men in the southern cities, even if they are rich. He wagged his head and looked about for admiration. Wang Hung listened anxiously. And then, he urged, he sat squatting upon his haunches at the bottom of the wagon, which was, after all, only an empty room made of wood and with nothing to sit upon, and the wind and the dust flying up through the cracks in the floor. Then, said the man, more loudly still, raising his voice above the din of the iron wheels beneath them, then you bind these together into a hut, and then you go out to beg, first smearing yourself with mud and filth to make yourselves as piteous as you can. Now, now Wang, Wang Lung had, had never, never in his, his life, life begged, begged of any, of any man. He disliked this notion of begging of strange people in the South. Okay, this does not surprise us, does it? Because we know Wang Lung is such a hard worker and has such an excellent work ethic. Uh, he is horrified at the thought that after he puts the mat, the hut together out of the mats, he's supposed to go out and beg. One must beg, he repeated. Ah, indeed, said the coarse-mouthed man. But not until you have eaten. These people in the South have so much rice that each morning you may go to a public kitchen and for a penny hold as much as you can in your belly of the white rice gruel. Then you can beg comfortably and buy bean curd and cabbage and garlic. Okay, so you see the way of life it is supposed to be allegedly in the city that after, before you go beg, there are public rice kitchens, uh, kind of like we have homeless shelters, a homeless shelter in Huntsville, right? Where if you're really hungry and you don't have any money, you can go over there and eat. Um, but Wang Lung has never heard of such a thing. This is completely foreign to him. But the man goes on, the man on the train goes on to explain that after you pay your rice in the morning, you can, they'll give you as much rice as you can eat, and then you'll be comfortable physically enough to go out and beg, and hopefully then you get that night enough money to buy some bean curd and cabbage and garlic. Um, withdrew a little from the others and turned himself about to the wall, and secretly with his hand in his girdle he counted out the pence he had left. There was enough for the six mats, and enough each for a penny for rice, and beyond that he had three pence left. 
It came over him with comfort that thus they could begin the new life. But the notion of holding up a bowl and begging of anyone who passed continued to distress him. It was very well for the old man and for the children and even for the woman, but he had his two hands. Is there no work for a man's hands? he asked of the man suddenly turning about. I work, said the man with contempt, and he spat upon the floor. You can pull a rich man in a yellow rickshaw, if you like, and sweat your blood out with heat as you run, and have your sweat freeze into a coat of ice on you when you stand waiting to be called. Give me begging. And he cursed a round curse, so that Wang Lung would not ask anything of him further. Okay, so when Wang Ling asks this man on the train, is there any way else to earn money than, than begging? Because that is so abhorrent to Wang Ling. And the man's like, Wang Ling says, can I work? And the man says, work? Like implying, what kind of a fool are you to want to work? Uh, because apparently the only work available for an uh, for an unskilled worker like Wang Ling, a farmer, the only work available is pulling a rickshaw. You might want to look up some pictures online of a rickshaw, but it's basically like a taxi made out of a taxi that's fashioned like a wheelbarrow, only it's more the the passenger would stand um, in the rickshaw. And then it has two handles that the puller has to pull. So, like, if I were pulling a rickshaw, it would be behind me, and uh, I would be running through the streets of the city because, of course, you're going to get paid more money if you can get your passenger to his destination faster. And it is very physical labor, as you will see and uh, forms blister. Oh, it's just horrendous. When it's described in detail much later on, oh, it's horrifying. It's such hard work. So I'm thinking, no wonder this man scoffs and says, work, if you want to work like a dog for very little reward, then yeah, go ahead, knock yourself out. But still, it was a good thing that he had heard what the man said. For when the fire wagon had carried them as far as it would and had turned them out upon the ground, Wang Lung had ready a plan, and he set the old man and the children against the long gray wall of the house which stood there, and he told the woman to watch them, and he went off to buy the mats, asking of this one and that where the market streets lay. At first he could scarcely understand what was said to him, so brittle and sharp was the sound which the southerners made when they spoke, and several times when he asked them they did not understand, they were impatient, and he learned to observe what sort of man he asked of, and to choose one with a kindlier face, for these southerners had tempers which were quick and easily ruffled. Okay, so we see that there is a little bit of a difficulty in understanding the people in this southern city because their accent is so unfamiliar to Wang Lun. And he is, his accent is unfamiliar to the shopkeepers. But he found the mat shop at last on the edge of the city, and he put his pennies down upon the counter as one who knew the price of the goods, and he carried away his roll of mats. When he returned to the spot where he had left the others, they stood there waiting. Although when he came, the boys cried out at him in relief, and he saw that they had been filled with terror in this strange place. Only the old man watched everything with pleasure and astonishment, and he murmured at Wang Long, You see how fat they all are, these southerners, and how pale and oily are their skins. They eat pork every day, doubtless. But none who passed looked at Wang Long and his family. Men came and went along the cobbled highway to the city, busy and intent and never glancing aside at beggars. And every little while a caravan of donkeys came pattering by, their small feet fitting neatly to the stones. And they were laden with baskets of brick for the building of houses, and with great bags of grain crossed upon their swaying backs. At the end of each caravan, the driver rode on the hindermost beast, and he carried a great whip, and this whip he cracked with a terrific noise over the backs of the beasts, shouting as he did so. And as he passed Wang Lung, each driver gave him a scornful and haughty look, 
and no prince could have looked more haughty than these drivers in their rough work coats as they passed by the small group of persons standing wondering at the edge of the roadway. It was the especial pleasure of each driver, seeing how strange Wang Lung and his family were, to crack his whip just as he passed them, and the sharp explosive cut of the air made them leap up, and seeing them leap, the drivers guffawed. And Wang Long was angry when this happened two or three times, and he turned away to see where he could put his hut. Okay, so all of that was explaining that Wang Lung and his family are just completely shell-shocked by this foreign city. It's, an, it's a very populous city, and of course Wang Lung is from a small town. And so they're just probably standing there open-mouthed, like looking at everything. And when the drivers drive by, they can tell that Wang Lung and his family are unfamiliar with the city. And so they get a real kick out of cracking their whips when, when they go by him and his, he and his family jump because they're so startled because that's a very loud noise if you've never heard it. And um, then they make fun of him and all that were already other huts clinging to the wall behind them, but what was inside the wall, none knew, and there was no way of knowing. It's Okay, so you'll find out later, like when they get off the train, they just uh, see some other people uh, with temporary shelters built along this wall, and so they're going to put their shelter, their little hut made out of mats against this wall, and as of now, they don't know what's behind this wall. That will be uh, important later. But I do want you to underline the simile that follows in the next sentence because it is just such a cool description that Pearl S. Buck uses. Out long and gray and very high. And against the base, the small mat sheds clung like fleas to a dog's back. Wang Long observed the huts, and he began to shape his own mats this way and that, but they were stiff and clumsy things at best, being made of split reeds, and he despaired when suddenly Olan said, That I can do. I remember it in my childhood. Of course she does. Here is Olan to save the day, and she remembers this from her childhood because uh, she was sold, you remember, to the great house of Wang when her family was... Uh, desperately uh, poor and so perhaps they had been homeless in a big city at one time and so she remembers how to construct this this hut out of six mats and she placed the girl upon the ground and pulled the mats thus and thus and shaped a rounded roof reaching to the ground and high enough for a man to sit under and not strike the top and upon the edges of the mats that were upon the ground, she placed bricks that were lying about, and she sent the boys to picking up more bricks. When it was finished, they went within, and with one mat she had contrived not to use, they made a floor and sat down and were sheltered. Okay, so would you suspect that this hut is uh, wider than it is tall? Uh, if you said yes, then you're right, because we found out that it's just tall enough that a man can sit without his head touching the top. I really cannot begin to imagine having to live with other people in something that small. Uh, I wonder if you would be able on a test to estimate the dimensions of this hut that's made out of six mats. Sitting thus and looking at each other, it seemed less than possible that the day before they had left their own house and their land, and that these were now a hundred miles away. It was a distance vast enough to have taken them weeks of walking, and at which they must have died, some of them, before it was done. Then the general feeling of plenty in this rich land, where no one seemed even hungered, filled them. And when Wang Lung said, let us go and seek the public kitchens, they rose up almost cheerfully and went out once more. And this time the small boys 
clattered their chopsticks against their bowls as they walked, for there would soon be something to put into them. And they found soon why the huts were built to that long wall. For a short distance beyond the northern end of it was a street, and along the street many people walked carrying bowls and buckets and vessels of tin, all empty. And these persons were going to the kitchens for the poor, which were at the end of the street and not far away. And so Wang Lung and his family mingled with these others, and with them they came at last to two great buildings made of mats, and everyone crowded into the open end of these buildings. Now in the rear of each building were earthen stoves, but larger than Wang Lung had ever seen, and on them iron cauldrons as big as small ponds. And when the great wooden lids were pried up, there was the good white rice bubbling and boiling, and clouds of fragrant steam rose up. Now when the people smelled this fragrance of rice, it was the sweetest in the world to their nostrils, and they all pressed forward in a great mass, and people called out, and mothers shouted in anger and fear, lest their children be trodden upon, and little babies cried, and the men who opened the cauldrons roared forth, Now there is enough for every man, and each in his turn. But nothing could stop the mass of hungry men and women, and they fought like beasts until all were fed. Wang Lung, caught in their midst, could do nothing but cling to his father and his two sons. And when he was swept to the great cauldron, he held out his bowl, and when it was filled, threw down his pence. And it was all he could do to stand sturdily and not be swept on before the thing was done. Then, when they had come to the street again and stood eating their rice, he ate and was filled, and there was a little left in his bowl, and he said, I will take this home to eat in the evening. But a man stood near, who was some sort of guard of the place, for he wore a special garment of blue and red, and he said sharply, No, and you can take nothing away except what is in your belly. Then Wang Lung marveled at this and said, Well, if I have paid my penny, what business is it of yours, if I carry it within or without me? The man said then, We must have this rule, for there are those whose hearts are so hard that they will come and buy this rice that is given for the poor. For a penny will not feed any man like this, and they will carry the rice home to feed to their pigs for slop. And the rice is for men and not for pigs. And so Wang Lung finds out that he's not allowed to take leftover rice to his home for later on in the night, even though he paid the penny for the bowl of rice. It's explained to him that that's because some people take advantage of this charity that's clearly meant for the poor, and they pay a penny and take home a lot of rice and then feed their animals with it. Wang Lung listened to this in astonishment. And he cried, Are there men as hard as this? And then he said, But why should any give like this to the poor? And who is it that gives? Okay, so Wang Lung has never heard of such charity like this, organized charity for the poor. And he's just wondering, why would anybody uh, provide for the poor? Uh, who is it that provides for the poor? Man answered, then, It is the rich and the gentry of the town who do it, and some do it for a good deed for the future, that by saving lives they may get married in heaven, and some do it for righteousness, that men may speak well of them. Nevertheless, it is a good deed for whatever reason, said Wang Long, and some must do it out of a good heart. And then, seeing that the man did not answer him, he added in his own defense, and least there are a few of these. But the man was weary of speaking with him, and he turned his back, and he hummed an idle tune. The children tugged at Wang Long then, and Wang Long led them all back to the hut they had made, and there they laid themselves down, and they slept until the next morning. For it was the first time since summer they had been filled with food, and sleep overcame them with fullness. The next morning it was necessary that there be more money, for they spent the last copper coin upon the morning's rice. Wang Lung looked at O Lan, doubtful as to what should be done, but it was not with the despair with which he had looked at her over their blank and empty fields, 
Here, with the coming and going of well-fed people upon the streets, with meat and vegetables in the markets, with fish swimming in the tubs in the fish market, surely it was not possible for a man and his children to starve. Huh. It was not as it was in their own land, where even silver could not buy food because there was none. And Olan answered him steadily, as though this were the life she had always known. I and the children can beg, and the old man also. His gray hairs will move some who will not give to me. Wow. And she called the two boys to her, for like children they had forgotten everything except that they had food again, and were in a strange place, and they ran to the street and stood staring at all that passed. And she said to them, Each of you, take your bowls and hold them thus, and cry out thus. And she took her empty bowl in her hand and held it out and called piteously, A heart, good sir, a heart, good lady, have a kind heart, a good deed for your life in heaven. The small cash, the copper coin you throw away, feed a starving child. The little boy stared at her and Wang Lung also. Where had she learned to cry thus? How much there was of this woman he did not know. She answered his look, saying, So I called when I was a child, and so I was fed. In such a year as this, I was sold a slave. Okay, so we find out a little bit more about Olan's past. And the reason she knows how to beg is because she was sold in a year like this when her family had nothing and they were destitute. Then the old man who had been sleeping awoke and they gave him a bowl, and the four of them went out on the road to beg. The woman began to call out and to shake her bowl at every passerby. She had thrust the girl child into her naked bosom, and the child slept, and its head bobbed this way and that as she moved, running hither and thither with her bowl outstretched before her. She pointed to the child as she begged, and she cried loudly, Unless you give, good sir, good lady, this child dies. We starve, we starve. And indeed the child looked dead, its head shaking this way and that. And there were some, a few, who tossed her unwillingly a small cash. But the boys, after a while, began to take the begging as play. And the elder one was ashamed and grinned sheepishly as he begged. And then their mother, perceiving it, dragged them into the hut and she slapped them soundly upon their jaws and she scolded them with anger. Now, I want you to pay attention starting on page 101 right here and continuing the rest of the time um, from, from now on. And you're going to notice a couple of things. First of all, neither of these boys have been given names at all. Um, maybe their parents just call them son, come here, or son one, who knows? But they don't have names yet. They've not been named. Um, and then secondly, you're going to notice that although these boys are close in age, about a year apart, they have very different attitudes toward money that begin to show up right now in the city. This will last throughout their lives. I don't know if you know this, I bet I haven't mentioned this to you, but The Good Earth is actually book one of a trilogy that Pearl S. Buck wrote. Uh, book two is called Sons, and book three is called A House Divided. And you see, uh, if you've read these other books, it's, it's also carried out, the different attitudes towards money that are formed very early in childhood. So what we just found out, and you will need to know for the quiz, is that the elder son was ashamed. Now, if the elder son is ashamed, would you think that maybe he inherited a little bit of his father's tendency toward pridefulness? Isn't that interesting? So the elder brother is ashamed of begging. He's really kind of embarrassed to be doing that, and he's kind of grinning sheep sheepishly. So if you can imagine, begging by saying, can you give us some money because we're kind of hungry. He's not going to get any money that way. Well, this makes Olan furious, as you're about to see. 
because she knows this is life and death. They must get enough to pay for their daily rice. And a penny sounds really cheap to us, but you're going to see. And do you talk of starving and then laugh at the same time? You fool, starve then. And she slapped them again and again until her own hands were sore and until the tears were running freely down their faces and they were sobbing. And she sent them out again saying, now are you fit to beg? That and more if you laugh again. Okay, so um, I don't think it's hyperbole that she slaps them again and again until her own hands were sore. That is just really shocking and frightening to me personally. As for Wang Lung, he went into the streets and asked hither and thither until he found a place where Jin rickshaws were for hire. And he went in and hired one for the day for the price of half a round of silver to be paid at night and then dragged the thing after him out to the street again, pulling it. Okay, so this is going to be another cost of living in the city. We already know that each person to eat a bowl of rice has to pay a penny. Now we find out that when Wang Ling wants to rent a rickshaw that he can use to earn money, it cost him half a round of silver. I don't know how much that is, but whatever it is, it's more than a penny. And so he has to, um, he's going to borrow the rickshaw, but when he returns it, he has to pay this designated amount. Now, in case you're thinking, well, maybe he shouldn't, he just shouldn't return it. Well, you know, his character is one of integrity and honesty. He would never steal. And then secondly, I'm sure he would be caught if he tried that. The wooden wagon on its two wheels behind him, it seemed to him that everyone looked at him for a fool. He was as awkward between its shafts as an ox yoked for the first time to the plow, and he could scarcely walk. Yet must he run if he were to earn his living? For here and there and everywhere through the streets of this city, men ran as they pulled other men in these. He went into a narrow side street where there were no shops, but only doors of homes closed and private. And he went up and down for a while, pulling to accustom himself. And just as he said to himself in despair that he had better beg, a door opened and an old man, spectacled and garbed as teacher, stepped forth and hailed him. Wang Lung at first began to tell him that he was too new at it to run, but the old man was deaf, for he heard nothing of what Wang Lung said, only motioning him tranquilly to lower the shafts and let him step in. And Wang Lung obeyed, not knowing what else to do, and feeling compelled to it by the deafness of the old man and by his well-dressed and learned looks. Then the old man, sitting erect, said, Take me to the Confucian temple. And there he sat, erect and calm. And there was that in his calmness, which allowed no question, so that Wang started forward as he saw others do, although he had no faintest knowledge of where the Confucian temple stood. Oh. But as he went, he asked, and since the road lay along crowded streets, with the vendors passing back and forth with their baskets, and women going out to market, and carriages drawn by horses, and many other vehicles like the one he pulled, and everything pressing against another, so that there was no possibility of running, he walked as swiftly as he was able, conscious always of the awkward bumping of his load behind him. To loads upon his back he was used, but not to pulling. And before the walls of the temple were in sight, his arms were aching and his hands blistered, for the shafts pressed spots where the hole did not touch. The old teacher stepped forth out of the rickshaw when Wang Long lowered it as he reached the temple gates, and feeling in the depths of his bosom, he drew out a small silver coin and gave it to Wang Long, saying, Now I never pay more than this, and there is no use in complaint. And with this he turned away and went into the temple. Okay, so this is not good. We don't know how much was that small silver piece, but we know it really wasn't enough. Wang Lung had not thought to complain, for he had not seen this coin before, and he did not know for how many pence it could be changed. He went to a rice shop nearby where money is changed, and the changer gave him for the coin 26 pence. 
And one will marvel at the ease with which money comes in the South. Hmm. But another rickshaw puller stood near and leaned over as he counted, and he said to Wang Long, All right, 26. How far did you pull that old head? And when Wang told him, the man cried out, Now there's a small-hearted old man. He gave you only half the proper fare. How much did you argue for before you started? I did not argue, said Wang Long. He said, Come, and I came. Mm. The other man looked at Wang Long pityingly. Okay, so we see, again, just like when Wang Lung in the beginning of the book goes to the house of Wang and the gatekeeper takes advantage of him, and when he demands uh, a bribe to take Wang Lung into the house of Wang, Wang Lung pulls out his wallet and opens it up in front of the gatekeeper. You remember that. Well, this is kind of the same thing. We see again how Wang Lung is naive. He's out of his element. He doesn't know that he's being taken advantage of. In the next line, uh, you're going to see that uh, this, this fellow rickshaw puller um, tells, he says, now there is a country lout for you. You've heard that expression? There's a country bumpkin, like a real dumb person. Pigtail and all. So he's referring to that old-fashioned traditional cue, that braid of hair hanging down from Wang Lung's head, which symbolizes uh, someone who is very traditional, uneducated, unwise in the ways of the world. It's definitely the opposite of sophistication. Now, you're going to see that this is frequently referenced, the pigtail and the country lout or the country bumpkin. And so this is, um, that's what the pigtail symbolizes to the city people. Now there's a country lout for you, pigtail and all, he called out to the bystanders. Someone says come, and he comes, and he never asks this idiot born of idiots, how much will you give me if I come? No, this. Idiot. Only white foreigners can be taken without argument. Their tempers are like quick blind. But when they say come, you may come and trust them, for they're such fools they do not know the proper price of anything. But let the silver run out of their pockets like water. And everyone listening laughed. Wang Lung said nothing. It was true that he felt very humble and ignorant in all this crowd of city people, and he pulled his vehicle away without a word in answer. Nevertheless, this will feed my children tomorrow, he said to himself stubbornly. And then he remembered that he had the rent of the vehicle to pay at night, and that indeed there was not yet half enough to do that. He had one more passenger during the morning, and with this one he argued and agreed upon a price, and in the afternoon two more called to him. But at night, when he counted out all his money in his hand, he had only a penny above the rent of the rickshaw. And wow. he went back to his hut in great bitterness, saying to himself that for labor greater than the labor of a day in a harvest field, he had earned only one copper penny. Wow, that's really awful, isn't it? So it's much harder work than farming. And after working all day, after he pays the rent for the rickshaw at night, he only has an, a profit of one penny which is his bowl of rice for tomorrow, right? Then there came flooding over him the memory of his land. He had not remembered it once during this strange day. But now the thought of it lying back there, far away, it is true, but waiting, and his own, filled him with peace. And so he came to his hut. When he entered there, he found that Olan had, for her day's begging, received forty small cash, which is less than five pence. And of the boys, the elder had eight cash, and the younger thirteen. And with these put together, there was enough to pay for the rice in the morning. Only, when they put the younger boys in with all, he howled for his own, and he loved the money he had begged, and slept with it that night in his hand, and they could not take it from him until he gave it himself for his own rights. Okay, so you'll want to make note of that. This is the younger boy, and he loves his money. First of all, he earned more than the elder. 
you're going to see that continue to play out. And then uh, he was very attached to his money. So maybe he, um, is it fair to say he inherited a tendency towards greed? Perhaps. But the old man had received nothing at all. All day long he had sat by the roadside obediently enough, but he did, but not, he beg. did not beg. He slept and woke and stared at what passed him. And when he grew weary, he slept again. And being of the older generation, he could not be reproved. In other words, no one can fuss at him for not pulling his weight, for not doing his share. He's not going to beg. And again, we see that's the importance of the patriarch. He doesn't have to. When he saw that his hands were empty, he said merely, I have plowed and I have sown seed and I have reaped harvest and thus have I filled my rice bowl. And I have beyond this begotten a son and son's sons. So the old man is saying, I had, I had kids. That's what I've done to deserve my daily rice. And with this he trusted like a child that now he would be fed seeing that he had a son and grandson. I think I want to do chapter 12, 12 right now. Now, after the first sharpness of Wang Long's hunger was over, and he saw that his children daily had something to eat, and he knew there was every morning rice to be had, and of his day's labor and of Olan's begging, there was enough to pay for it, the strangeness of his life passed, and he began to feel what this city was to whose fringes he clung. Running about the streets every day and all day long, he learned to know this city after a fashion, and he saw this and that of its secret parts. He learned that in the morning, the people he drew in his vehicle, if they were women, went to the market, and if they were men, they went to the schools and to the houses of business. But what sort of schools these were, he had no way of knowing, beyond the fact that they were called such names as the Great School of Western Learning or as the Great School of China, for he never went beyond the gates. And if he had gone in, well, he knew someone would have come to ask him what he did out of his place. And what houses of business they were to which he drew men, he did not know, since when he was paid, it was all he knew. And at night he knew that he drew men to big tea houses and to places of pleasure. Can you circle tea houses? Because this is the first or second time we are hearing about tea houses but they are the equivalent of bars, I suppose, and uh, maybe almost like the old-fashioned saloon that you see in shows like Gunsmoke, if you even know what Gunsmoke is. That is open and streams out on the streets in the sound of music and of gaming with pieces of ivory and bamboo upon a wooden table, and the pleasure that is secret and silent and hidden behind walls. But none of these pleasures did Wang Lung know for himself, since his feet crossed no threshold except that of his own hut, and his road was always ended at a gate. Okay, underline this next sentence because it is a wonderful simile that Pearl S. Buck uses to show, to illustrate how foreign Wang Lung feels in the city he's never going to get used to life in the city because it's not what he knows and he's a special sort of character. He lived in the rich city as alien as a rat in a rich man's house that is fed on scraps thrown away and hides here and there and is never a part of the real life of the house. So do you know what that's saying? Think about how foreign, how unwelcome all kinds of synonyms that would be good for you to explore. But a rat in a rich man's house would be completely foreign, uh, unwanted, exterminated, a pest, a, a, you know, considered by the rich as filth, you know, filthy. Um, so all of these things are really how Wang Lung uh, feels and is viewed by the people who have grown up in the city. So it was that although a hundred miles are not so far as a thousand, and land road never so far as water road, 
Yet Wang Lung and his wife and children were like foreigners in this southern city. It is true that the people who went about the streets had black hair and eyes, as Wang Lung and all his family had, and as all did in the country where Wang Lung was born. And it is true that if one listened to the language of these southerners, it could be understood, if with difficulty. But An Hui is not Jiang Su. In An Hui, and I just want to say that if you had a test question, something like, um, how contrast how maybe compare and contrast how Wang Lung is to the residents of the city. Well, the way that they are similar is that they both have dark hair and black hair and black eyes and they speak the same language. But that's how they're similar, but their differences are many. Ang Lung was born, the language is slow and deep and it wells from the throat. But in the Jiangsu city where they now live, the people spoke in syllables which splintered from their lips and from the ends of their tongues. And where Wang Lung's field spread out in slow and leisurely harvest twice a year of wheat and rice and a bit of corn and beans and garlic, here in the farms about the city, men urged their land with perpetual stinking fertilizing of human wastes to force the land to a hurried bearing of this vegetable and that besides their rice. So even in the farming in this southern city, uh, they use human manure instead of uh, animal manure. Wow. In Wang Long's country, a man, if he had a roll of good wheat bread and a sprig of garlic in it, had a good meal and needed no more. But here the people dabbled with pork balls and bamboo shoots and chestnuts stewed with chicken and goose giblets and this and that of vegetables. And when an honest man came by smelling of yesterday's garlic, they lifted their noses and cried out, now here is a reeking pigtailed northerner. Okay, so again we see this reference to pigtailed, the ponytail, the queue, the old-fashioned braid, and how it's viewed by the sophisticated city people as ignorant. Now we're also seeing that connected with that is the smell of garlic, garlic breath. Apparently that's more of a, of a lower class person from the north, uneducated, just right there along with the, the cue, the hair. The smell of the garlic would make the very shopkeepers in the cloth shops raise the price of blue cotton cloth as they might raise the price for a foreigner. But then the little village of sheds clinging to the wall never became a part of the city or of the countryside which stretched beyond. And once when Wang Lung heard a young man haranguing a crowd at the corner of the Confucian temple where any man may stand if he has the courage to speak out, and the young man said that China must have a revolution and must rise against the hated foreigners, Wang Lung was alarmed and slunk away, feeling that he was the foreigner against whom the young man spoke with such passion. And when on another day he heard another young man speaking, for this city was full of young men speaking, and he said at his street corner that the people of China must unite and must educate themselves in these times, it did not occur to Wang Long that anyone was speaking to him. It was only one day when he was on the street of the silk markets looking for a passenger that he learned better than he had known, and that there were those who were more foreign than he in this city. Okay, so now Wang Lung is about to meet a true foreigner. Happened on this day to pass by the door of a shop from whence ladies sometimes came after purchasing silks within, and sometimes thus he secured one who paid him better than most. And on this day, someone did come out on him suddenly, a creature the like of whom he had never seen before. He had no idea whether it was male or female, but it was tall and dressed in a straight black robe of some rough, harsh material, and there was the skin of a dead animal wrapped about its neck. As he passed, the person, whether male or female, motioned to him sharply to lower the shafts, and he did so. And when he stood erect again, dazed at what had befallen him, the person, in broken accents, directed that he was to go to the street of bridges. He began to run hurriedly, scarcely knowing what he did, and once he called to another puller, whom he knew casually in the day's work, Look at this! What is this I pull? <laughs> and the man shouted back to him, A foreigner! 
a female from America. You are rich. But Wang Lung ran as fast as he could for fear of the strange creature behind him. And when he reached the street of bridges, he was exhausted and dripping with his sweat. Huh. This female stepped out then and said in the same broken accents, You need not have run yourself to death. And left him with two silver pieces in his palm, which was double the usual fare. Okay, so I'm thinking that maybe the reason he did not know whether it was a male or female is because her hair was pulled back into a bun. And so she had short hair like a man, but maybe her facial structure looked more like a female than a man. And uh, so he was very confused. She also spoke Chinese, but with a very strange accent, very odd way of speaking. I think that's kind of funny. But you know, all of this has been reminding me I, my son is an, is an English teacher, well, a teacher here in town at a different school, and he was telling me that one of his high school students uh, was, is from Africa and recently wrote a paper for him explaining all the uh, mistreatment he had received uh, in America, specifically in Houston when he lived there, when he first came from, uh, I think it was Nigeria, he lived in Houston, it was so terrible because uh, he one time he was overcharged. They could tell that he was a foreigner, you know, not from the U.S. originally, and he paid nine dollars. They charged nine dollars for a cup of ice cream, and he found out later that it should have been three dollars. And there were other such examples, and that made me so sad to think of. Uh, people taking advantage of foreigners. I guess it happens, and I just don't move in those circles to know that, but it really makes me sad to think of that. Wang Lung knew that this was indeed a foreigner, and more foreign yet than he in this city, and that after all, people of black hair and black eyes are one sort, and people of light hair and light eyes of another sort, and he was no longer after that wholly foreign in the city. Having picked up an American woman with light hair, now he knows, yes, I'm not like these people in the city, but I am more like the people in the city than, than that woman. Going back to the hut that night with the silver he had received still untouched, he told Olan, and she said, I have seen them. I always beg of them, for they alone will drop silver rather than copper into my bowl. But neither Wang Lung nor his wife felt that the foreigner dropped silver because of any goodness of heart, but rather because of ignorance and not knowing that copper is more correct to give to beggars than silver. Right, so he's understanding that it's not because these Americans are nicer that they are giving so much money and good tips, it's that they don't know better. Through this experience, Wang Lung learned what the young men had not taught him, that he belonged to his own kind, who had black hair and black eyes. Clinging thus to the outskirts of the great sprawling opulent city, it seemed that at least there could not be any lack of food. Wang Lung and his family had come from a country where if men starve, it is because there is no food. Since the land cannot bear under a relentless heaven, silver in the hand was worth little because it could buy nothing where nothing was. Here in the city there was food everywhere. The cobbled streets of the fish market were lined with great baskets of big silver fish caught in the night out of the teeming river, with tubs of small shining fish dipped out of a net cast over a pool, with heaps of yellow crabs squirming and nipping in peevish astonishment with writhing eels for gourmands at the feasts. At the grain markets, there were such baskets of grain that a man might step into them and sink and smother and none know it who did not see it. White rice and brown and dark yellow wheat and pale gold wheat and yellow soybeans and red beans and green broad beans and canary-colored millet and gray sesame. And at the meat markets, whole hogs hung by their necks, split open the length of their great bodies to show the red meat and the layers of goodly fat, the skin soft and thick and white. And duck shops hung row upon row over their ceilings and in their doors, the brown baked 
ducks that had been slowly turned on a spit before coals, and the white salted ducks, and the strings of duck giblets, and so with the shops that sold geese and pheasant and every kind of fowl. As for the vegetables, there was everything which the hand of man could coax from the soil. Glittering red radishes and white, hollow lotus root and taro, green cabbages and celery, curling bean sprouts and brown chestnuts and garnishes of fragrant cress. There was nothing which the appetite of man might desire that was not to be found upon the streets of the markets of that city. And going hither and thither were the vendors of sweets and fruits and nuts and of hot delicacies of sweet potatoes browned in sweet oils and little delicately spiced balls of pork wrapped in dough and steamed and sugar cakes made of glutinous rice and the children of the city ran out to the vendors of these things with their hands full of pennies and they bought and they ate until their skins glistened with sugar and oil. Yes, one would say that in this city there could be none who starved. No. Still, every morning, a little after dawn, Wang Long and his family came out of their hut, and with their bowls and chopsticks they made a small group in the long procession of people, each issuing from his hut, shivering in clothes too thin for the damp river fog, walking curved against the chill morning wind to the public kitchen where for a penny a man might buy a bowl of thin rice gruel. And with all Wang Long's pulling and running mm. before his rickshaw, and with all Olan's begging, they never could gain enough to cook rice daily in their own hut. Isn't that shocking? I hope you paid attention to that. With every day with Wang Long's rickshaw pulling, and every day with Olan's begging, they never get ahead. They never even get enough money to cook in their own hut. That's just awful. You know, like to cook their own rice and get ahead. If there was a penny over and above the price of the rice at the kitchens for the poor, they bought a bit of cabbage. But the cabbage was dear at any that price. Means expensive. So the two boys must go to hunt for fuel to cook it between the two bricks Olan had set up for a stove. And this fuel they had to snatch by hands full as they could from the farmers who carried the loads of reed and grass into the city fuel markets. Sometimes okay, so in order to be able to cook any cabbage, if she gets extra money, they have to steal fuel. You can't, there are no, you know, uh, there's no trees and grass and all that around in the city. We were caught and cuffed soundly. And one night, the elder, elder man, lad, who was more timid than the younger and more, more ashamed, ashamed of what, of what he, did, he did, came back with an eye swollen shut from the blow of a farmer's hand. But the younger lad grew adept, and indeed more adept at petty thieving than at begging. Okay, so you're going to note that, right? The younger child loves money, is willing to do anything, right or wrong, to get more money. And so he grows better and better at stealing than at begging. Something's about to happen. To Olan, this was nothing. If the boy could not be without laughing and play, let them steal to fill their bellies. But Wang Long, although he had no answer for her, felt his gorge rise at this thievery of his sons. And he did not blame the elder when he was slow at the business. Okay, so you need maybe a test question could be uh, contrast Olan and Wang Ling's attitudes towards their son's thieving, thieving, stealing and thieving. Uh, Olan, of course, does she doesn't mind at all. She's a very practical person. Uh, if the boys can't uh, play like they would at home, then it's okay with her if they steal. But Wang Ling doesn't like it one bit, and that's why he doesn't get mad when uh, the elder son doesn't earn as much with his begging because he doesn't like that either. You know, he believes in good old, hard, uh, old-fashioned work. Life in the shadow of the Great Wall was not the life Wang Ling loved. There was his land waiting for him. One night he came late, and there was in the stew of cabbage a good round piece of pork. Wow. It was the first time they had had flesh to eat since they killed their own ox. Okay, and so they haven't had meat in months and months, not since they killed the ox. And Wang Ling is just shocked. 
pleasantly surprised, right? His eyes widened. You must have begged of a foreigner this day, he said to Avram. But she, according to her habit, said nothing. Then the younger boy, too young for wisdom and filled with his own pride of cleverness, said, I took it. It is mine, this meat. In other words, I stole it. When the butcher looked the other way after he had sliced it from the big piece upon the counter, I ran under an old woman's arm who had come to buy it and seized it and ran into an alley and hid in a dry water jar at the back gate until elder brother came. Now I will not eat this meat, cried Wang Long angrily. We will eat meat that we can buy or beg, but not that which we steal. Beggars we may be, but thieves we are not. Why don't you underline that? Beggars we may be, but thieves we are not. Took the meat out of the pot with his two fingers and threw it upon the ground and was heedless of the younger lad's howling. So he is so furious that this meat was stolen. He picks it up out of the dish and he throws it on the ground. Watch what happens. Then Olan came forward in her stolid fashion, and she picked up the meat and washed it off with a little water and thrust it back into the boiling pot. Meat is meat, she said quietly. Wang Long said nothing then, but he was angry and afraid in his heart because his sons were growing into thieves here in this city. Okay, underline, he was afraid in his heart because his sons were growing into thieves here in the city. And although he said nothing when Olan pulled the tender cooked flesh apart with her chopsticks, and although he said nothing when she gave great pieces of it to the old man and to the boys, and even filled the mouth of the girl with it and ate of it herself, he himself would have none of it, contenting himself with the cabbage he had bought. Now those of you who eat meat and love meat, can you imagine what self-discipline, what self-control this would take when you had not eaten meat in months and finally there is meat in your own little hut yet his morals are so good that he is not going to eat the meat that is stolen he's watching each family member eat this meat but he is making the stand this is immoral this is wrong to steal and I'm not participating I marvel at that, and also I hope you picked up and would be able to answer on a test uh, how his and Olan's attitudes towards uh, stealing, and especially this meat episode, that would be important to note. But after the meal was over, he took his younger son into the street out of the hearing of the woman, and there behind a the house he took the boy's head under his arm and cuffed it soundly on this side and that, and would not stop for the lad's bellowing. There okay, so... Uh, he, a couple of things. He takes the son where Olan cannot hear. And so that's either out of, I don't think he's afraid of Olan, he's the man. But it's probably out of respect. He doesn't want to have a conflict with her, but he wants to teach this kid a lesson. And so the second thing, when he cuffs him, that's like with his fist on either side of the kid's head. He's He's given him the business. And there, he shouted, that for a thief. But to himself, he said, when he had let the boy go, sniveling home, we must get back to the land. So we see that the city is corrupting his children, and he does not want to stay there. He knows that he's going to lose the hearts of his kids if he does not get them back home to the land.